The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, we're finishing up our look at the 2015 Detroit Maker Fair. We've got three more Hacktiques Roadshow projects to judge based off cool factor, usefulness, manufacturability, and market potential. We'll also keep tabs on what cool things Felix is finding all around the show. Let's get started. Amazing Hacks. How can we make this portable? Inspired Designs. I am the internet troll. Regrettable acting. Bat them hatches! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Our next guest is Vinny Jokai. What have you built here? Uh, this is an Xbox 360 peripheral. It has a seven inch LCD in it, a wireless uh, audio res video receiver inside of it, and the Xbox streams wireless video to it. Oh, so it's kind of like the Wii U, except for it might have games you want to play. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, where did you get the audio video transceiver? Oh, it's, it's actually all built into the screen's uh, main board. Oh, okay, cool. All right. So I can take this into the bathroom or into the garage and play the Xbox anywhere. Uh, exactly. You, um, you get very- It feels like Batman would have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, what were you saying about, oh, what is the range on it? Uh, it depends if it goes through walls or not. And also, this one has a 5.8 gigahertz uh, video receiver in there. So at, at my uh, apartment, I have a 2.4 gigahertz wireless video receiver. So between two walls, I can get good video signal, but anything beyond that, it kind of starts drastically a uh, drop in video quality. Did you cut the uh, controller circuit board in half or did you rewire it from scratch? Well, well, that was the thing. I did two prototypes of it. I cut it in half and try to go pinpoint to pinpoint. But the, uh, like, I don't know. I, I wouldn't even try that. I, I got most of the buttons to work, but I think the crystal inside of it was like losing its frequency because it was now, it was also giving me false signals. Mm -hmm. Buttons would click when I didn't press them. So what I did was I cut one circuit board in half and I depopulated one completely and just carried everything over into it. So you basically used two to make one? Exactly. That makes sense. So one has, one's is completely depopulated. So the screen looked like this and then you attached the controllers onto the end of it with Bondo, you said? Uh, Bondo and uh, <laughs> JB Weld. It was, it was, it's all done by hand, actually. The screen was a little bit wider, but I took it just a straight a knife and cut it down mm -hmm. and bondoed it together. Then I did the same thing with the controller. It totally looks like something Batman would have. I know I keep coming <laughs> back to that. What does this switch here do? It was last minute, just trying to get it done. I threw whatever toggle switch I had available. Is it the power switch? Uh, yeah, it's the okay. power switch to the controller and the rece a wireless receiver. Oh, so you're getting the power for the controller off of the battery for the screen? Yeah, exactly. What is this volume and contrast here? Yeah, yep. Okay, and what is the deal with the helmet? Well, so the helmet, it's kind of a fake 3D helmet. It has a wireless screen inside of it with audio, so you just completely like get immersed inside Can of I it. Can I take a look? It's time to finish the fight. <laughs> You've always wondered who Master Chief is? It's me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's review the Master Chief helmet. Cool factor. It's very cool that he turned a Halo helmet into a working display. The Bondo work to expand the viewing area matches very well with the original plastic and paint. Maybe hacking an Oculus Rift next? I'll give the cool factor a seven. Usefulness. Remote control play is one of the best features on the Wii U, and now this can be done on the Xbox 360. I'd rate its usefulness as an eight, or even nine if your significant other is addicted to reality TV when you just want to play games. Manufacturability. It's all handmade and involves a lot of custom work and LCD hacking, so I'd give this project a manufacturability rating of two at best. Kind of hard to duplicate, plus all that Bondo. Market potential. The remote controller could probably sell if it was $150 or less. I'd give that a seven for market potential. The helmet is basically just a novelty, but a pretty cool one. Now that we've helped Master Chief defeat the flood, let's take a break and see what Felix is up to. This is Mr. Steve. Yep. 
nice with to meet uh, you. Poor man's props. Poor man props yes. All right, tell us about what you do here. Um, we're a prop building club. Uh -huh. um, basically, we make everything uh, that you see here. Yeah, it looks like a lot of your things are really simple. Yeah, yeah, like mostly really cool and creepy. Sim at the same time. Simple motors. It's it, that's the concept behind it. A lot of people, and we've noticed a lot of people don't know. Some people don't know how to use like tools in general, mm -hmm. um, or or even how to engineer stuff. So basically, we take we do all the legwork, and then we buy all the raw materials, and then we give them a pile of stuff, and then they build it. It, it all looks really great. And where can somebody go if they wanted to find out more about this? Poor man's props uh, at Weebly.com. Okay, that's great. Or uh, or find us on Facebook. Okay. Hey, Mr. Steve. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks a lot. Yeah. We're here with Rob Caruso. Thanks for coming. Hey, Ben. And so you're all the way from Canada, right? Yes, I am. I'm from uh, Windsor, Ontario, Canada, which is just across the river. Nice, nice. Um, what have you brought today? This is the Magic Eye Color Organ. It's uh, a modification of the color organs that were very popular back in the 70s and 80s. All right. And the uh, color organs typically use different colored lamps. And it I was, was going to say this one's all green. Yes. It is a color, but... Yes, and uh, instead of using the uh, different colored lamps, this one uses uh, Magic Eye tubes. Okay, what was the purpose of a Magic Tube back in the day? Magic eye tubes were uh, typically used for level indicators or tuning indicators, and uh, you would find them in radios. Uh, typically, you'd find them in some test equipment. Uh, for example, uh, capacitance meters uh, use magic eyes. All right. What kind of signal do you put into a magic eye tube? It's a DC signal that uh, is applied to the grid, and the, as the voltage on the grid varies, the pattern displayed on the tube varies also. Is it, the, the, is it the level of voltage changes? Correct. Okay. Yes. And that causes the grid to lumess wider or narrower? Exactly. Okay. Why does that happen? That uh, happens because uh, you're varying the current uh, in the tube itself. So there's a current that flows from the cathode to the anode, and you're varying the current by varying the voltage on the, the grid. Okay. So these were used as indicators back in the day. Yes. And now you've turned them into a type of graphic equalizer indicator, so you can pump music into it or an oscillator wave of some sort, and you can actually see the results. Exactly. All right. Okay, I'm looking at your block diagram here. It looks like you've got audio coming into it, so you have a phone, it looks like, that you can use. Yes, I can use a phone or a shuffle. All right. You've got, a, oh, the LM386, like the very standard uh, uh, amplifier. Okay, and then you, you take it through basically four different filters here into some op amps and then to your tubes, which are powered by a high voltage down here. Correct. Okay. All right. That looks pretty straightforward. Can you give us a demo? Sure. Make like um, some music? Put some music through. So you said you preheat these before you do anything with them. That way you don't have to heat them up every time and it extends their life. Yeah, it's uh, always better for a tube that it's warmed up before you apply the high voltage. And one of the units in uh, the project here is a uh, slow start. So after about 30 to 45 seconds, the high voltage comes on after the tube's been, uh, after the filaments on the tubes have been enabled. Yeah, I remember, I do remember having a few things with tubes in them when I was a kid. And you'd see that they were glowing through like the vent grills. And they're like, oh, I think this thing's ready to go now. All right, well, thanks for stopping by. Thank you, Ben. Let's review the Magic Eye Color Organ. Cool factor. Well, it has a great retro look. Audiophiles love vacuum tubes, so it has a nostalgia factor going as well. I'd give the cool factor a nine. Usefulness. Ultimately, all it really does is visualize certain frequencies of sound piped into it, and the displays aren't super large, so I'd rate the usefulness a three. Manufacturability. I think this is where you'd run into problems. It has several transformers crammed into that box, which adds cost and weight. Plus it uses fairly high voltages. The tubes themselves are likely new old stock or Russian surplus, kind of hard to find in volume. Therefore, I'd rate the manufacturability a two. Market potential. Vintage audio is hot. So I'm sure a lot of people would buy this, even if the price was kind of high. I'd give it a market potential rating of six. Now that we're done rocking out to some vintage tunes, let's see what Felix is doing as he explores the show. Uh, what's your name and what is this that you're showing off here? All right, so my name is Allison Neisler and I'm a competitive youth robotics coach, a position a number of people haven't heard of. 
This is VEX IQ. It's part of the VEX Robotics progression of educational robotics programs. Uh, this particular kit is the VEX IQ. It's a plastic snap together kit developed for students in third through eighth grade. It's very flexible. There's a number of different ways that you can use it. Um, the primary way that I involve kids with the robotics is through the competition environment where there's a new game challenge every year. Kids work together in small teams. I have three or four students per team on mine yeah. to design, build, and program a robot to play the game challenge yeah. where they then have the opportunity to compete at local, state, and global level events um, to earn a number of awards and network with like-minded peers. Well, if somebody wants to learn more about this and get their kid involved, how do they do that? Uh, there's two websites they can go to. Uh, the first one is Vex Robotics. It's um, vexrobotics.com. That's mm -hmm. the company that designs and develops all of the products. Okay. There's also the Robotics Education and Competition Foundation, which is the nonprofit that administers all of the competitions. Um, both the VEX competitions and a number of other opportunities uh, throughout the nation. So both of those websites provide a whole host of information and if you go to the REC Foundation website you'll be able to find the contact for a regional support manager that can help get teams started, work on funding, find sources of grants and work uh, network new coaches with experienced coaches in the area um, for kind of a mentoring relationship. Yeah that sounds really great, thank you very much. Now you can enjoy the perils of space travel in the comfort of your very own Maker Faire with the Artemis Spaceship Bridge Simulator. This is Jody Applegate. How's it going? How are you, Ben? And you put this together? I and everybody else at Lansing Makers Network. Okay. Tell us more about what you built. Well, we have taken uh, software that is available and you can purchase it from Tom Robertson online. And uh, it is a bridge simulator. It is a land game where everybody plays a station on a Starship bridge. And then you have to go and save your sector. So what is a bridge simulator? So you're saying it's just like when you're in the Navy and you've got the captain and like the coal person and the uh, gun guy. So except you have you're not roles. shoveling coal. But yes, you have uh, space coal. Space coal. Clean, burning space coal. Good point. Because you can't kill the space whales because you need those in part four. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you have stations, like you have helm and you have weapons and engineering and science and communications. And then of course there's a captain. So the captain has to actually take all the, everybody else's information and give the orders. Which oh. is surprisingly harder than you think. So the software is something that you buy, so anyone can build this. Yes, Artemis, Art, Artemis Spaceship Bridge Simulator. Okay, so it's all about how you want to put it together into a simulator. So it's like, here's the software, build whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah, it just runs on PCs, and we've added a bunch of extra lighting effects. Is that supported by the software? Yep. Yep. Okay, cool. Very nice. Uh, so what's your favorite part about the simulator? My favorite part is playing LAN games all my life. This is cooperative. Everybody has to communicate. Everybody has to pay attention to everybody else. And you have to, you have to listen to other people, which is you know, hard for a lot of nerds to do. So, uh... <laughs> the Call of Duty noobs probably get in here and just try to kill everyone, right? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. <laughs> Let's review the Artemis Star Trek Simulator. Cool Factor makes you feel like you're in a real starship, or at least as close as we can get until that farmer from Babe invents warp drive. They had just put this unit together so it's a little rough around the edges, but I'd still give it a cool factor of seven. Usefulness. Let's face it, this is a video game, but I guess it could teach people how to work together as a team, so I'd rate its usefulness as a 5. Manufacturability. You need a lot of parts to put something like the Artemis together, but it could be done with older computers, projectors, and flat panels that you could get for free, or perhaps very cheaply off Craigslist. Still looks like a lot of work, so I'll give the manufacturability a 4. Market potential. In its current form, I don't really think you could sell this. Perhaps it would have shrunken down and simplified a bit in some sort of arcade type machine. I'd have to give market potential a two. 
Now that I'm done conquering galaxies while some people are still learning to spell their names, let's check up on Felix. Hello, Miss Minchie. Hi. I hear you make this really wonderful fuel efficient vehicle. Please tell us about it. Sure. Uh, so this is our uh, super mileage vehicle. Mm -hmm. The point of this vehicle is to run as many miles as we can per gallon. Um, the entire thing is made of carbon fiber, as you can see, and is about 10 feet long, two and a half feet wide, and about the same in height. Uh, this vehicle can achieve a mileage of 3,421 miles per gallon. So uh, that means we can circumvent the Earth at about 12 to 13 gallons of fuel. Um, it, ran, it runs standard uh, 87 octane, just out of like the pump. Okay. Um, we built our own uh, custom design and manufactured in-house our own uh, internal combustion engine. Whoa. Uh, so it's about 45 cc's, one horsepower. Um, it outputs just enough power to move this vehicle. Um, for the for the race that like uh, we exactly partake in. Enough? Okay, with a, a little bit of a safety factor for you know when we might have to go uphill a little bit. Um, we also do tune the engine so that it runs at an RPM that's optimized for like this level of performance. It has the capability of doing more, uh, but as it's set up right now, it won't. But other than the drivetrain, uh, a much bigger aspect of the vehicle is its um, overall efficiency when it's just kind of cruising at speed. Mm -hmm. um, our driving strategy is a huge part of how we can achieve such ridiculous fuel efficiency, and that's because our engine's not really on even most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, we have to very carefully calibrate and strategically time when we apply um, a driving force to the vehicle so that we push it just enough to keep it going is essentially what it comes down to. So we got first place at the Shell Eco Marathon in uh, 2015 in the Americas awesome. category. So yeah, um, the prototype vehicle, we work on one year design cycles, which means starting from uh, computer aided design right up until full uh, prototype and uh, testing completed is a one year cycle. Mm -hmm. Um, this is our third generation now, so the third year that we competed in the Shell Eco Marathon. The year before this, we got second place, and the year before that, our vehicle fell apart on track. Aww. So, um, we've been making some good progress in the last few years, and in Definitely. the... Yeah, I, I would say, I'm, I'm happy with uh, what we've been doing. And then in the upcoming year, we're hoping to break into the battery electric category, which mm -hmm. would just be a purely electric car. Wow. Similar concept behind it, but the drive will just be a little bit different. And if Somebody, if one of our viewers wants to know more about your club and uh, what you've done with this, how do they find out? Um, the best place to start would be our website, which is not a very um, easy to find URL, so okay. I would recommend just search engineering uh, University of Toronto Super Mileage, and we will be okay. the first hit. Um, aside from that, if there's any specific details they wanted about the mm -hmm. team, were interested in asking questions on a technical level, they could just email us. It's at utsupermileage at gmail.com. Okay. It's spelled exactly how it sounds. So it's very easy to find us, and I'll be the person who responds to that email personally. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem at all. It's my pleasure. It. Thank yeah. you, Felix. Thanks for joining us on our tour of Detroit Maker Faire 2015. That's all the time we have for today. Be sure to check out Alma14.com for more information on all our upcoming builds, episodes, and special events. We'll see you next time. The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com.